5. Luke chapter 5, the lady's walking down the aisle. They have a Bible for you if you need it. New Testament, third book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in. It's the third of the Gospels. Gospel means good news, Ulangelion. The good news is God loves you and gave you his son as a propitiation for your sins so that you don't have to go to hell. Ha. He's your savior. Call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So they call them the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's uh, four different perspectives of the life of Jesus on this earth, the years of his ministry. It's like watching something happen on a, a, a four street intersection and somebody's on each corner and they all have a different perspective. They got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They see different things and some of them replicate it. Uh, I love Luke when it comes to anything retaining, pertaining to medical because Luke was a physician. Uh, he was given by his, the, the, the person he served assigned him to travel uh, and to help the apostles. And so he observed this and wrote and everything he writes is almost from a, a physician's perspective. And I love when he's dealing with leprosy, uh, which is what we're gonna see here. Uh, Jesus cleanses a leper. And it, it reminds me of a very famous hit song back in Israel back in that day. Leprosy, I'm not half the man I used to be. Something like that, I can't remember. Stupid, I know. Before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, before we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord, I wanted to tell you this, not, not yet, just a sec, before we stand, I, I don't say that fast enough and I mumble, so that's not your fault, that's mine. Um, I wanted to tell you this, we do the anchored reading series, two years through the Bible, and I do the same thing you do, and I was commenting as I was, I, I, I've been in, Wash, I was in Vancouver, Washington, I came back here, then I went to Bakersfield, I came back here, then I went to Phoenix, I came back here, I've been traveling a lot, and I, I told Mike, I said, I love the Anchored series because through the course of the week, I, I don't have the ability a lot of pastors do to spend you know, eight, 10 hours in the study and you know, breaking down and parsing every jot and tittle of the original Greek and Hebrew. And, um, and I just say, Lord, you know, these folks are showing up. I got a book report due. Can you? <laughs> and as I'm reading through it, the Lord speaks uh, and, and everything's in context. I, I, I wanna do good scholarship and I do. Um, but I, I was leaving Vancouver, Washington, and I was up there helping Heidi St. John. She's running for Congress against a guy named Joe Kent, who was endorsed by Trump, and then Heidi was 11 points down in the polls, and they started to realize who this guy was, and now she's two points up. Yeah, <laughs> neat lady. Like, who is she, who is she? Yeah, uh, and, and she, uh, she's on the cutting edge of uh, the homeschool movement, um, and, and she's, a, a prolific author, a speaker, nationally known. And I was up there and as we were getting ready to leave, it was late that night and the weather was kind of bad and we're coming back in a twin prop, you know, you know, Washington to Camarillo. And she goes, she goes, be safe. I hate that statement. Don't use that with me. I'm so sick of it. Safe, being safe got us into this garbage. 18 months, be safe. I don't wanna be safe anymore. I wanna be dangerous and wise. I told Heidi, I go, Heidi, I'm immortal until God's done with me. And I gotta get back to Camarillo because there's stuff to do. Now, be safe. What are you talking about? <laughs> wise is doing the right thing. Daniel's and his sister, they're going to the Ukraine. Be safe. No, be dangerous and wise and be courageous. And, and it's wise because there's people suffering and they're going into the danger to help them. Stand on the street corner and pray for, you know, young ladies going in to have their babies killed and be ridiculed and have stuff thrown at you. Be safe. No, no, no. Be courageous. Be wise. Be dangerous. Contend. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of Christ in the midst of the conflict. You're gonna contend with ideologies. You have a tyrant that says, the church is non-essential during our Holy Week. And you contend. It's not safe, you're gonna get fined, you're gonna get shut down, they're gonna come after you, they're gonna bring you before the judge for contempt charge. I don't care. I'd rather 
do what's wise. And that's right. You don't have the right to tell the church it's not essential. They were open during the bubonic plague, for goodness sakes. Governor Mussolini, you don't have that right. So we're going to open the church on our Holy Week, and that's all there is to it. So... So I was, I, I was like really fired up about that statement, be safe. And then I get to Luke 5, and I see Jesus heals a leper. I, I don't know about you, but I am intrigued everywhere I see that a, a leper's been healed in the scripture. The 10 lepers were healed, only one came back to say thank you. And le- no, no lepers had been healed. I mean, in, in Leviticus 13 and 14, they give, you know, two chapters to diagnosing the disease, and then a temple sacrifice or ceremony when someone is healed of it, that the priest had never used in the history of Israel. And you're like, he didn't do it for cancer or typhoid or smallpox or COVID. He did it for leprosy. I I think there's like 100,000 people worldwide that have leprosy. It's not, it's Hansen's disease. And people think it's, you know, heavily contagious. It's not. Dr. Paul Brand, a a book called Gift of Pain, uh, he was born in 1914. He died a couple years ago lived into his 90s, the, the man was the foremost doctor in treating lepers, Hansen's disease. It's not contagious to the extent that everyone feared it was. And you think that your, your flesh falls off of you because of the disease. It's not. What happens is you, you lose feeling. Your body doesn't feel anything anymore. All the pain sensors go away, so you step on a nail and you don't know it. It, it, it infects, gets gangrene, and then it starts to stink and smell and you die. You, you, you pick up a hot pan, not realizing that you're burning your hand and, and you don't feel it. You, you reach into the fire to get your baked potato and the campfire that's wrapped in tinfoil and you don't feel anything. He, he, would, he would document children who had broken both their ankles running in the playground, not feeling anything. A two-year-old toddler, the mother goes into the nursery and sees the walls painted with blood and she's just aghast and realizes a child has bitten off the tips of the fingers and painted all over the wall with their fingers. Leprosy takes away feeling, takes away pain. And you wonder why God would spend two chapters thousands of years ago describing it and then brings us to Luke chapter five where the physician, Luke, would describe this passage in such detail. And what does it mean to us today in a time where America wants to be safe? Well, let's see. Let's see what God has to say. Let's stand for the reading of the word, Lord. Elders, welcome. How you fellows doing? Honored to have you here. You know what I love about LDS? They're always willing to go anywhere. And every time I go into an LDS church, they let me speak. And they never hinder me. I don't get that with JWs or anything like that. Welcome, you guys. And I'm glad you're in the front row. Let's welcome the elders from the LDS. All right. Uh, Luke chapter five, verse 12. And it happened when Jesus was in a certain city that behold a man who was full of leprosy. And that's a medical term saying he didn't have just, he's covered in this stuff. I mean, he is, it's taken its full course in the the medical condition. Full of leprosy, saw Jesus and he fell on his face and he implored Jesus saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then, he, then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, which makes the rabbi unclean, which is Levitical law, ceremonial. Jesus said, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him. Immediately, like boom, like smooth as a baby's butt. Just boom, just like that. I can't say that, I'm a pastor. And he charged him to tell no one. And then he uses this out of Leviticus 14. This is the Levitical law, watch. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses had commanded. However, the report went out around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by Jesus of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. The only thing the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them, they didn't ask him how to raise the dead or walk on water. The only thing they ever asked him to teach him, not once but twice, was how to pray, because they knew that his public life of power was a result of his private life of prayer. And when multitudes would come for healing and he's pouring his life out and he's, you know, seeing lepers and seeing the worst of humanity and smelling the pus and all the, he went to a solitary place and would commune with the Father. The Bible says that long before the sun would arise, he'd go to a solitary place and commune with the Father. He always took time to pray. You want to get through this season of 18 months of living hell and you, you want to be strong, spend some time in prayer. Is there anything worth doing that could be done apart from prayer? 
And the answer is no. And every great awakening and revival in America started with prayer. So that ministry that Tammy has, prayer. So that's the conclusion of that portion of the scripture. We're going to cover the top part, but I'm going to pray first because that's what I just talked about. Lord, we thank you that thousands of years ago you would go to great lengths to have the scribes pen an articulate diagnosis of a disease that wasn't rampant, one that is no worse or better than anything else. You would place great significance upon it. And then thousands of years later, as your servant Luke would be penning these words from the perspective of a physician, witnessing you, Lord, saying I'm willing and touching him, and a disease that to this day we haven't found a cure for, he would be immediately healed. Lord, why would you do all that? Why would you make it such an issue? Why would you tell him to go to the priest? Why did you give a sacrifice in the temple for something that so few contract? Lord, I, I thank you that you've aligned it even this day that you use those passages to minister to my heart in this time of trial and difficulty and heartache and pain. And I'm grateful, God, how you move heaven and earth to speak to us and minister to us. And what a wonderful father you are. Lord, thank you for your gift. And I pray your blessing upon all who are in the hearing of my voice, that Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth, that your word is living and breathing and sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Bless us now, we pray. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Grab a seat, relax, not too much. After the second service, a lady came up to me and she was saying, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic and I've been coming to your church. I said, I don't have the apostolic authority to do the transubstantiation. She says, I know, but I still come. And she said, I went to Maximilian Colby and they closed during the pandemic and it made me so upset. And I go, I mean, the church is named after a guy that contended with tyranny. The Catholic priest that like saved Jews, you know? I said, no, I get it. And she said, and I... I don't want to betray my faith, but I, I just love being here. I said, we love being, having you here. I said, my parents were Catholic. My, my sister's Catholic. I, I always say that um, my Catholic parents couldn't come to their Protestant son's ordination because they were their Jewish godson's bar mitzvah. <laughs> That's true. I, I, was, I was talking with uh, one of the quorum of the 70, a friend of mine. I won't throw him under the bus, but I said, I said, you're the only denomination in America that considers the, the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution to be sacred. And you bowed to tyranny. He goes, I know. I know. I, I'm, I'm grieved by it. And I think folks are struggling in this season. I think every church in America is struggling to figure out where does freedom come from and to what point do we stand and why aren't we and what's the why and what we're doing? What motivates our silence? as the abused are being quarantined with the abusers, as the children's schools are being shuttered for a virus that affects them 0.0002%. The only time in American history with a virus that affects primarily the elderly, because the elderly would always serve the younger and, 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 and set the future for them. But now, for the sake of a few extra years, we shutter their schools to protect grandma and grandpa. So the kids are called to serve the parents, or the grandparents, and said, what, what happened to America? And even there, it's 99.7%, which means comorbidities, things that you've already possessed, and, and when are we going to deal with that? And now everybody, and we've gone through this, but my point is, what's caused us to have this national psychosis that we're walking around muzzled? And I, I've said oftentimes, if, if, if Dr. Fauci told us that the virus only affected you from four feet to the ground, he could get us all in America crawling. Get down, get down. You're going to get down. You're, you're going to get the virus. You're going to get the virus. Two masks, two masks. Ah, ah. Jim Brewer. And we're... We're paralyzed by fear. And, and 
I, I, I've been reading a book after Heidi said that to me. I picked up a book and I, I was stunned by it and I did some in-depth study on the man, Dr. Paul Brand. A doctor who was the foremost doctor, he's since passed on, on leprosy, the disease. And his history is fascinating. His parents were born in England. He was born in India. His parents during the Victorian era um, went to India as missionaries and he was born in India in the foothills, 4,000 feet high in an area which they called uh, the Death Mountain, or the Black Mountain or Death Mountain because any missionary who went up there died, anyone who went up there died because they had all kinds of malaria and everything else. So they go right into the thick of it because there's people up there and there's villages and they go and they set it up. They start, he and his wife were middle class, they weren't medically trained but they took some classes as missionaries learn the language, learn medical, basic medical techniques and sterilization. And they bring what they have and they build the stuff and, and people start coming to them to have teeth pulled and all these things. And, and, and they, they were there for over 20 years and to have a single convert. No one had come to Christ. And, they're, and, and he's growing up there and avoiding all the you know, deadly vipers and the cobras and the scorpions. And, you know, and, and, and they come and they'd have worms that were under the skin. You could see them at night moving in the... And, and, and the... And the dad discovered this way, if you put the, the, the infected area of the, of the parasite in the cold water, it would, it, it would, it would uh, present itself outside the skin, lay its eggs in the water, and then you'd take a stick and you'd wrap it around and then tie the stick down to the wrist, as because if you pulled it too tight, the worm would break, the infection would cause a disease in the body. And so then, then he'd do it until it was just about to snap and then he'd tie it down and then the worm would relax and then he'd twist a little bit more and he had to do it like seven hours and pull this worm out. And sometimes they're like this, like, oh, gag a maggot. I mean, and they're, they're dealing with this stuff and I'm reading about this guy, born in 1914 in India. His childhood is spent, you know, in mango trees and on the back of water buffaloes and, and watching his dad and mom do this. And not a single convert until... The witch doctor of the community, the Spanish influenza blows through India as it did the whole world. People are dropping like flies and they're going around with these canvas bags of boiled rice water because with dysentery you get dehydrated and they're bringing it around to the villages to, you know, rehydrate the villagers. And they go into the, the doctor, the witch doctor guy, the priesty thing guy, and, and he's so moved by it, he said, none of my family would, would dare come in. You did. I want my children to be Christian. And as they pass, they made sure that, and, and uh, when they died, they had the children go with the brand. So uh, Paul Brand ended up having a brother and a sister who were both born in India, and all three of them became doctors. So at nine years of age, they send him back to England while they remain on the mission field to go be educated. He's there for six years. He's now 15, and his parents are coming off the mission field for a respite. They've been there a long time. He's waiting, he's excited, he's now, he's 16 years old, and he, he's so excited, and he gets a telegram, says, your father died. Uh, 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 missionary Brand died, please break the news to his son gently. Well, he just got the thing like, your dad's dead. Is that gentle enough? And he's stunned. His mother comes, and now she's widowed, she comes off the gangplank of the ship, and though her, his father died in his 40s, she was in her early 40s. He said when she came off the gangplank of the ship, she looked like a woman in her 80s, bent over, hunched over, decrepit. She kept repeating herself. She had trauma. The pain was so immense of what she endured. And, and, and we thought mentally she wasn't going to recover. It, it was her, her best friend died. She's devastated. Two years she recovers and she says, I'm going back. She goes back as a widow to India and continues the work, and she died at 96. They have a monument built to her there. She was an amazing woman. They called her the grandmother of the mountain. And Paul Brand went on to become a doctor, wanted to honor his mother and father. He spent about 25 years in India. He would go back there and help with all of the Hansen cases, the leprosy cases, and became foremost doctor in it. He obviously spent 25, 26 years in London, and he was there during the Blitzkrieg as he was going through his medical practice, doing his internship, and he was helping all the folks during the bombing from Nazi Germany. And he said, I, I, I marveled when I was in India to see how they dealt with pain, and I marveled in London how they dealt with pain. In the last years of his life, he was in America, and he marveled at how Americans deal with pain. 
He came off, I'm almost done, we'll get into it. He came off of a missions trip in India dealing with Hansen's patients, leprosy, comes to the United States to give a lecture. He's not feeling well on the transatlantic crossing. He gets there that night, he speaks. He speaks and he's in a hostel, and he, uh, staying in a, uh, like a youth hostel. He finishes speaking, he feels terribly ill. He barely gets to the hostel. He collapses in the hallway, manages to crawl into his room and collapses. Fevers, chills, just miserable. He rings the button, the bellman comes, brings him orange juice, milk, and some bread, and he's there for six days, and the man checks on him to see if he's still breathing. They don't know who he is, they just are caring for him. He misses his appointment where he's supposed to speak. The doctor who noticed he wasn't there realized he had seen him at the last place. He didn't look well, so he went through all the hostels asking if this man's here, found him and brought him, and then got him into a clinic and started helping him get back on his feet. He finally recovered and had to get back to England, so they put him on a ship. He was still deathly ill. He travels, travels over the Atlantic, gets into Southampton, and he's just miserable. Everything's a blur. He's just sick as a dog. He gets on the train, and he falls asleep and doesn't even remember arriving in London. His mother's still in India. His dad is dead. He goes to his aunt's house and collapses there. And as he's in the room getting ready to get into bed, he takes off his shoe and realizes he can't feel the bottom of his foot. Well, he knows what that means. Leprosy. It begins on the appendages and the loss of feeling because the pain sensors die. And he's panicking because he has told the world and, and educated the world that leprosy is not contagious and encouraged the workers to step into the middle of it. And now he's contracted. He's going to be the laughing stock of all of the British Empire, similar to what we were facing when anyone would get COVID, they wanted to report it all over the news as though we were killing grandmother and now we know how stupid all that is. He takes a needle, trying to get feeling and his foot feels nothing. He takes a needle and he hits it and blood starts to come up, he felt nothing. He's overwhelmed. These are his quotes. He said, once I realized I had no feeling in my foot and the realization that leprosy had infected me, he said, ordinary pleasures in life would slip away, petting a dog, running a hand across fine silk, holding a child, soon all sensations would feel alike, dead. He had a sleepless night that night Wondering how he was going to break the news, he tossed and turned. He said, that night became a defining moment. I had caught only a fleeting glimpse of life without touch and pain, and yet that glimpse was enough to make me feel frightened and alone. The next morning, when I learned with a start that my foot had come back to life, he had fallen asleep on the train in such a way that his sciatica had cut the nerves and he had a good night's sleep and it started to recover. And he, he, he steps on it and he says, I had crossed a chasm back to normal life and breathed the prayer, thank you God for pain. Never have I felt a sensation as delicious as that live electric jolt of pain. <laughs> he says, I've repeated that prayer a hundred times since. To some people that prayer may seem odd, even an oxymoronic or masochistic. It came to me in a reflexive rush of gratitude. For the first time I understood how leprosy victims could look with envy upon those of us who feel pain. And then he started to reflect on his three-part life, India, England, America. And I like what he says here. He says, I was fascinated in the United States. He said, a nation whose war for independence was fought in part to guarantee a right to the pursuit of happiness, I encountered a society that seeks to avoid pain at all costs. He said, each of these groups, Londoners who suffered gladly for a cause, they would sing in, in the metro tunnels of London they would reflect back on the bombings as the happiest time in their life as they would work in unison to remove those trapped in the rubble and they would stand together as one in the impending invasion of Hitler. And they stood against fascism. He said in India, those, the Indians who expected suffering and learned not to fear it. And he said Americans who suffered 
less, but feared it the most. I readily admit that my years of working among pain-deprived people has given me a skewed perspective. I now regard pain as one of the most remarkable design features of the human body. And if I could choose one gift for my leprosy patients, it would be the gift of pain. Few experiences in life are more universal than pain, which flows like lava beneath the crust of daily life. And this is his last quote. And this is, for me, one of the most profound. We speak of physical pain. I had an ingrown fingernail, and I hit it on the plate at the dinner last night in Phoenix. I couldn't handle it. It's like, you okay? I'm fine. It's like Michelle sees his hair growing right here, the Brezhnev brow thing. She goes, bink. My little toe's like, connected to every nerve in my body. I'm like, ah, ah, ah. That's physical pain, but listen to what Dr. Brand says, because this is more problematic and more prolific. Some pains, the pain of grief or emotional trauma have no physical stimulus, whatever. They are states of mind concocted by the alchemy of the brain. These feats of consciousness make it possible for suffering to loiter in the mind long after the body's need for it has passed. That emotional trauma is a prison you've created. You want vengeance. And you live in a world of pain and unforgiveness. And it causes you to be fearful. And you, you take drugs to make the memories go away. Most of the serial killers in America were on antidepressants takes away your empathy. You don't feel anything. I, I'm doing great. No, I, I, don't, I don't really feel anything. But I don't feel bad. I, don't, I, don't feel, I just don't feel anything. Oh, you have food running down your... Oh, okay. I don't feel that either. <laughs> and that's the world we strive after as the antidepressant, anti-anxiety drugs go through the roof and Big Pharma wants to pump us full of it. We just walk around avoiding pain. Even the the marketing, I haven't got time for the pain. Painkiller. Extra super duper strength painkiller. What are you so afraid of pain for? It's a gift from God. Pain is there to tell us that things are not right. In the passage... Jesus is in a certain city, and behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, fell on his face, implored him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You can heal me. Speaking metaphorically, we use the word dead to describe a temporary state of painlessness, as when a dentist deadens a tooth or when we leave a leg crossed so long it goes numb. And then Dr. Brand said, from pain-deprived people, I have learned that I cannot easily enjoy life without the protection provided by pain. What are you talking about, Doc? Pain is a reminder that something's wrong. This is a world of pain. We're a fallen people. We have a sin nature. Hurting people hurt people. If you don't believe me, come on into the ministry. Sheep turn into wolves and wolves turn into sheep and some of them are right in the middle. They're like, ah, 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 they're like a chimera. <laughs> and this man who's riddled, and I gotta tell you something. They equate leprosy with sin. And it makes sense. The Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season. I mean, it really, it is fun, I gotta tell you. I, I tried to see if it worked. I didn't succeed. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but the end therein is death. You do a study on the intensity of porn, pornography in the culture in America today, and it is deadening the male mind. Sex is an expression of intimacy, both physical, emotional, and spiritual, but it, Mentally engaging in self-indulgence night after night after night after night, image after image after image after image after, you become numb. 
You're dull. You have no ability to see this as a gift from God of intimacy that you can express the connection of a human heart to another. You're just numb. Drugs. Drugs pick you up, take all your dopamines, leave you further back than where they picked you up. Your family's decimated. And you took the drug because you didn't want to face the pain. And then you took the drugs even without the pain because you just liked the high. And the high isn't real. And we find ourselves becoming numb. And sin is pleasurable for a season, but the end there in is death. It, it, pain's difficult. You've got a tough relationship at home, your marriage. And you don't want to deal with the pain of having to talk it out. So you just check out because the person there is always so engaging and sweet. And they just, the way they look at you, I mean, they believe in you more than they do. Because you're unwilling to deal with the pain at home and engage here in the painlessness, which will ultimately be pain because your children will suffer and will devastate the culture. I met a couple, Cy and Rachel Zorn. They've been married 72 years. Um, it was at the Oakwood. It was an apartment complex in Coronado where I was lifeguarding. They were in their 90s. They were the freaking cutest couple ever. They were in their 90s, and they, they finished each other's sentences, and they were giggling, and they just loved each other. And I'm like, man, and I was single at the time. I'm looking, I'm going, 72 years of marriage. This is epic. And I go, Cy, how did you meet the love of your life? How did you know that this was your lifelong like, connection? It was an arranged marriage by my parents, and I hated her for the five year, first five years. I, I, I wanted to kill her. And she wanted to kill me. And I look at his wife, she goes, oh my God, yes. And I go, what happened? He said, we realized there was no out. Drugs is a way out. We had to deal with the pain. The pain of endeavoring to get to know one another. Revealing things that we didn't want anyone else to know and open up. He said, at the five-year mark, I realized what a remarkable woman she is. And I've been madly in love with her ever since. And she goes, oh, he is so handsome. <laughs> I didn't always think so. They're like not even five feet. And he's, anyway, I'll leave it alone. But I'm like, not Brad Pitt, you know. No, he is, and he's way better looking. If you endeavor, you survive it. This picture of Jesus and the way that Luke describes it, this man's entire body is pain-free. And I want to tell you, if you want to find a pain-free place on this earth, just go to a leper colony. It exists. This man's pain-free. He doesn't feel anything. He doesn't feel the touch of a human hand or the softness of his wife's hair or the holding of his child, the petting of a dog. He doesn't feel anything. He doesn't feel a burn, a cut, a slap, a kiss, nothing. He's numb. Numb. Plain is, sin is pleasurable for a season, but the end there in his death, he's, he's, he's a walking dead man. And he's starting to stink because the wounds are festered. And he comes to Jesus and he says, I've heard what you said. You said that you've come that they might have life and life more abundant. This is not an abundant life. This isn't even living. I'm a walking dead man. I saw you raise the dead. I've seen you walk on water. I've seen the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind see. And he declares in this statement before Luke, as Luke pens this, it says, Lord, if you're willing... I know you can do this. I don't doubt you. You're God. Help me. I want to live. But life needs pain. Jesus put his hand out and he touched him. A man who hadn't sensed the touch of human hand in a long time, immediately, he feels everything. Jesus said, I'm willing and he heals him, 
Immediately as he's cleansed, the leprosy leaves him. And he says, don't tell anyone, but I want you to go and show yourself to the priest. And Jesus touches him. And the idea, it seemed as though he was past feeling, and it reminds me of Ephesians 4. Paul says, this I say, therefore testifying in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness in their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to the lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Pornography in its, in its most vile form takes on abuse because people need to abuse one another to just feel something. It's no longer intimacy. I'm dying and I, I, I've got to abuse innocence. I've, I've got to, I just don't, I, nothing. That's humanity. Apart from God, we become walking dead people. Void of feeling. Good. This man was separated from his family by his disease as we get separated from our family by our sin. Jewish law customs held one person had to be six feet away from a leper. If the wind blew toward a person from a leper, they had to be 150 feet. The only thing more defiling than contact with a leper was contact with a dead body. Now, not a prolific disease. Why would God take two chapters, Leviticus 13, 14, and they're not short chapters, they're long chapters. Why would he take two chapters to describe it and also define a remedy for it in the temple if someone is healed? Now, here it is, Leviticus 14. The priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, hyssop. The priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. So you get two birds. One of them, you rip its head off and you run it underwater and put the blood in the water in the basin. The other sweet little dove, you take the cedar and the hyssop and you wrap that sucker on that branch with the scarlet thread. <laughs> And then you run it under the blood of the bird that died. Seven times. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And then it says you let it go in the field. It's like, hoo, One bird would die, the other would fly. What's the point? One bird would die, the other would fly. Seven is the number of completion. Blood must be shed for the remission of sin. Christ would die that you would fly, have life more abundant. You'd be set free from the law of sin and death by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You're no longer bound by the law of sin and death. Your sin has been cleansed and forgiven. The sweet little bird and his buddy. Come on, there we go. One would die and the other would fly. I gotta wrap it up and I will. Propitiation. I'm glad you guys are here because this is a perfect illustration. I went to the Mormon School of Religion in Claremont. I was a guest, invited by Elder Oaks. I got to meet him, amazing man. I'm with um, Kevin Hamilton, Quorum of the 70, uh, a couple of other guys, two bishops. And we get there and we're late. Thank God I was wearing a blazer because everybody's in a suit and tie. You know the deal. <laughs> and they'd save seats in the front. I didn't know what this thing was. And they were talking to me the whole way. And then we get there and we walk down and we sit down. And I sit down. Um, and as I'm there, oh, what's his name? Um, it'll come to me. He's in charge of the temple in um, Los Angeles. So we're there, Matt Ball. And at the end of it, it was, it was on religious liberty. It was really good. I thought it was great. And at the end of it, all these folks come up to meet, you know, it's cool to meet an apostle. They all come up to meet one of the apostles. And, and I'm leaving, and Matt Ball is on the stage, and he goes like this. And he says, um, 
Elder Oaks is not going to be meeting with anyone. He waves at me. And I turn to David and I go, he wants you up there. He goes, no, he's waving you. And I go, dude, I'm the only one without a tie. He's like, no, 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 he wants you up there. And I walk through and it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. And I walk up, what's he doing? Here's a tie. You know, it's like, you know. <laughs> and I get up there and Elder Oaks says, I've been wanting to meet you, Mayor. I said, well, uh, please forgive me. Before today, I didn't know who you were, but I loved your message and it's an honor to meet you. He said, I just testified before the Mexican Senate uh, because they, their constitution doesn't allow clergy to hold office and you hold office and I used you as an as a example. He says, I was looking forward to meeting you and I said, wow. He said, they, they were looking at us because a hierarchical denomination and I used you as an example, a test case. He said, and I'm, I'm very honored to meet you. I said, I'm honored to meet you. And it was, it was great. I come back down. And now all of a sudden, everyone's looking at me like, who's he? And I get in the car with all my buddies, and nobody's talking. I'm like, did somebody die? Uh, you met Elder Oaks? I go, yeah. And I, I go, you guys have great reverence. And he says, yeah. I said, let me tell you the distinction between Latter-day Saints and evangelicals. And they're like, what? I said, because you guys do all your ecumenical outreaches. You want to meet all, meet all the, and they're really good. They have every faith. I said, the only ones you don't get at these clergy meetings are evangelicals. They don't come. He goes, I know. I go, I'll tell you how to do it. Okay. And I said, you need to know the difference between sanctification and justification. You guys have sanctification down. You're reverential. You're respectful. Sanctified means set apart. So I had a coffee mug. It's my favorite. It's from Cyprus. It's a Starbucks. I got it there. I just love the feel of it. And every morning I'd have coffee in it. And one morning I went out and I saw the tomato plant in the backyard. And it was kind of drooping. And I went out and I put it on the cinder block wall and I tied up the tomato plant. I got distracted. I went in the house. Well, tomato plants grow vociferously. And I'm blaming everyone. Who stole my cup? You know, because I forgot where I put it. It's being hidden by the tomato plant until the fall when the plant dies. I'm going, there's my cup. I'm sorry, everybody. And I go out and, you know, I do lattes, so the milk is all nasty and everything. And I said, it's the master's cup. And it's still good, but it's unfit for the master's use because it's dirty. I said, you guys understand cleaning the vessel. You don't drink, smoke, or chew, or hang around. You guys got it down. You, you mor morally, you... You, you've got, you run circles around the evangelical community, but the justification is what you don't get. Justification is just as if I'd never sinned. And they go, what do you mean? I said, one of your bishops to be unnamed is a very dear friend, and I'm friends with all of them, so they didn't know who it was. I said, he came to me, and he said, can I borrow $3,000? I said, Bishop, I don't loan money. I'll give it to you. Come on by. He was crying, sweet, took it. Called later and said, can I borrow 1,500 more? I said, I don't loan money, I'll give it, come on, buy. To his credit, sanctified, he paid off every penny. Never asked him to, it was a gift. And they're going, well, what's, what, what's this have to do with it? I said, well, I have one question for you guys. Why didn't he ask you? See, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. I'm saved by grace through faith. I didn't earn it. God gave it to me. I don't have to earn it. I said, once you guys get that down, this is going to be a powerhouse that we will, we will dominate Christendom. And I've had really great conversations. And that was like the defining moment for us. And the reason why I say that is justification is the picture of the dove. We're walking dead people, inundated in sin and a fear of pain, Christ had to die so we could fly. We're more concerned with our safety, safe, free from harm or danger, pain or hurt. That world doesn't exist except on a leper colony. I'm sick and tired of people telling me, be safe. There's no freedom. You, you, you can't be free from harm or danger. It's out there. And you need to go into the danger for the sake of those who are stuck in it. And you gotta reach out to the hand of the ones that can't feel anything and they're dying. You gotta go places like you guys do into homes that you've never been before in communities you've never been to love on them. That's not safe. You go to the Ukraine, it's not safe. Forget safe. This is, this is what's paralyzed our country. Stay safe, stay home, directive. We're COVID safe. Stay, stay home. 
staying safe got us into this national psychosis of fear and submission to tyranny. Let's not be safe. You are free to no longer fear pain or fear risk. How do I know this? Amen. <laughs> Wrapping it up. How do I know this? We're going to Israel. One of my favorite spots. Purported to be, but I doubt it is. There are some places that I know it is, but this is one of them. Ah, I'm not so sure. The Via Dolorosa. You see, Jesus touched the leper and gave him back his feeling, but he said, it comes with pain. But that pain is not going to be arbitrary. It's going to be purposeful. All things now will work together for good with those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. You see, Jesus walked the Via Dolorosa with his cross after they had beat the living daylights out of him with a cat of nine tails and put the crown of thorns on his head, put a cloth over his head when his hands were tied and sucker punched him. He was already brutalized and beaten before they ever gave him the cross and he had to walk it up to Golgotha. He was bleeding out the whole way up. No man takes his life. He willingly laid it down. He endured the pain and the humiliation of the cross. He was willing to die so you could fly. He endured the Via Dolorosa, Dolorosa, the way of pain. Sin causes pain. He paid for it. One would die, the other would fly. It's a picture. Washed in the blood. Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the remission of your sins. What a good Savior we have. And now... He was willing to go to a cross. What's the why in what you're doing? Is it a fear of pain or is it obedience to wisdom? Because doing the right thing is always wise. Is it dangerous? That was dangerous. That was really dangerous. but it was wise and it was needed. I gotta wrap this up, I'll do it. <laughs> I had, the man who had shared Christ with me, discipled me, some of you know this, but it, it works. The man who shared Christ with me, discipled me, married three kids. I, I, as a single man, I ended up in an inappropriate relationship with one of the girls in the youth group and I, she was pregnant and we were gonna get married. I told my parents, they were furious, neither of them were believers, we weren't churchgoers. My dad said, don't have her um, have the baby, just have her get an abortion. I said, I can't do that, it's against what I believe. My father said, look where your beliefs have gotten you so far. I said, dad, I can't do that, it's a baby. He says, it's, it's a blob of tissue, I said, it's a baby. He said, listen, you give birth to that child, you'll never step foot in this house again. I was a young man at the time, and I said, seriously? And they said, yes, I knew my dad. I said, well, I love you and I'm gonna miss you, and I walked out. That's the day I became a man. They were true to their word. I was so overwhelmed and so depressed. And then I went and took my, my pastor and had to tell him, that he, the college pastor had discipled me. I, and I, I, I took him out to Dinky Creek and I shared with him and I, I told him what had happened. And it was a most uncomfortable drive. He didn't talk to me the whole way. I just felt terrible. Legalistic church, I didn't have a friend in the world. Almost done. My fiance and I drive up to Hume Lake to go to a Christian concert because I'm just... I'm inundated with pain. I don't want to even be around anymore. I come back down, pull the car over the side. She takes off her engagement ring. She says, I have to tell you something. I said, what? She says, I slept with Steve. That's the guy who's married, three kids, discipled me. And I said, all right. I would like to have known that before I told my parents. I said, the marriage is off. But... And you know what? I didn't have a friend in the world. I was a sales rep and I had accounts on the other side of the coastal range going to Watsonville and I knew a bend in the road where you just go and, and you, you don't live. You just poof. And I am speeding up to go there and I am, I'm, I've had it with God. I can't deal with the pain of separation from my family and being lied to and being cheated. And I said, and I stood for you and I stood for life and I contended and this is what I get. Where are you? And I'm going to that bend in the road and, and I black out and I wake up realizing just as I come through the fog, I didn't do it. And then I felt like a coward. And then I just pulled the car over and I just had it out with the Lord. He said, basically, are you done yet? I got this. It's painful, but this is life and trust me.
I'll work it together for good. Through the course of that, my mother confessed to having had two abortions between my sister and I, and I was supposed to have been aborted. She told me that on her deathbed as she was dying of cancer. Amazing story. I got to lead. I was saved by my godmother and Michelle's grandmother who hosted a baby shower for me. They were Admiral's wives. Long story, super cool. I got to lead both of them to the Lord. And the greatest part of it is my mom said, I'm so happy that I didn't do that. And all of that led to my parents' faith. And it hurt like hell. And I'm so thankful for the pain. Be dangerous. He died so you can fly. Live. Life more abundant. Go into the danger. Do stuff to save people and minister. Quit being afraid of pain. There's no such thing as free from harm or danger. This guy right here in this picture, he's a be- he climbed El Capitan without ropes, just his hands. Crazy. Well, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to go to a school board meeting, which is worse. No, I'm kidding. Let's see. I'm having problems with it. A ship is safest in port, but a ship is meant to sail. This is a picture of the Mayflower. It's a replica. I want to read to you about the Mayflower. Can we go to the next slide? There we go. 45 of the 102 Mayflower passengers died in the winter of 1620, 1621. The Mayflower colonists suffered greatly during their first winter in the New World. Lack of shelter, scurvy, general conditions on board ship. When the Mayflower left Plymouth, Plymouth on April 5th, 1621, she sailed back to England, but only half her crew. They were not safe. What they did was dangerous, wise, and courageous. And this is the very first political document ever written on the North American continent. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, of the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, defender of the faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly, mutually, in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Church isn't supposed to be involved in politics. Well, welcome to the Mayflower Compact. <laughs> and by the way, that was 1620. The Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. You're 245 years into this unprecedented freedom established by people who didn't stay in port. Half of them died. And you're here because of their courage. And you want to roll over for the next generation and give up their schools and their freedom and their religious liberty because you're afraid? You want to be safe? That's not Christendom. It's time to be dangerous and wise. Amen. Now let's stand and I'll pray for you. (laughs) I was going to have the worship team come up, but I've I've kept you too long. You guys are wonderful. And by the way, you got the full sermon. The other services didn't. And you're like, oh, thanks. (laughs) Fellas, thanks for coming. God bless you guys. Thanks for what you do for our community. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your blessing upon our lives. And I thank you for the elders who are here. I pray a blessing on them. Lord, we ask your covering over them. Lord, we thank you that you haven't called us to be safe. We're not, we don't have a spirit of fear. We're not free from harm or danger. That doesn't exist in a fallen world. We're to take chances. Courage is spelled R-I-S-K. And you have called us to be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus and no weapon fashioned against us will stand. We're to be engaged. We're to, having done everything, stand. We're to be in, in the public square. And Lord, I thank you you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I just pray right now, Lord, that you would fill us with this hunger, that we would be dangerous in the eyes of the enemy and wise in your eyes, that we know that wisdom is doing what's right. We're no longer afraid of what the enemy seeks to do to us because we are immortal until you're done with us, and the only thing they can threaten us with is heaven. And whatever you want to do to this body in the meantime that would result in pain, we know that it'll work together for good with those who love you. So, hey, it's settled, God. We're yours. Let's get, let's get to work. You and uh, God, you're the majority, and anyone joining you is on the winning team. And we ask, God, that you would use us for your glory. 
Help our community. Help us stand in the gap for the least of these and the kids who are committing suicide, the churches that have shuttered and the schools that have closed and the, the fear that has paralyzed our nation and the businesses that have suffered and the, the tyranny that has violated these sacred documents. God, please awaken your bride. We are no longer going to be safe. And I thank you, God, for that courage. Because in the absence of courage, truth is an orphan. But not here and not in this city. And Lord, it's awakening across this nation and across the world. I thank you for the courage of Daniel, Marie, and all the folks in Love Life. Lord, thank you. We love you, we praise you, we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.